So in this presentation, we will learn about psychological theories, review effective communication skills, as well as how to develop therapeutic relationships with our patients. Sigmund Freud is considered the father of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis focuses on discovering the causes of the client's unconscious and repressed thoughts, feelings, and conflicts, which are believed to cause anxiety. And also, psychoanalysis helps to gain insight into conflicts and anxieties and how to resolve these problems. Freud and analytic therapy techniques focused on um, free association, dream analysis, as well as interpretation of a person's behavior. According to Freud, there are three levels of awareness, the conscious, the pre-conscious, and the unconscious. So the conscious level refers to perceptions, thoughts, and emotions that exist in a person's awareness, such as being aware of happy feelings, or thinking about a loved one. The pre-conscious thoughts and emotions are not currently in a person's awareness, but he or she can recall them with some effort. For example, an adult remembering how they felt as a child or thought as a child. The unconscious is a realm of thoughts and feelings that motivates a person even though he or she is totally unaware of them. According to Sigmund Freud, a human's personality is composed of three different components, the id, the ego, and superego. The id is the part of one's nature that reflects basic innate desires such as pleasure-seeking behaviors, aggression, and sexual impulses. The id seeks instant gratification. The superego is a part of a person's nature that reflects moral and ethical concepts, values, and parental and social expectations. Therefore, it is direct opposition of the id or to the id. The third component is the ego. The ego balances or is a meditating force between the id and the superego. The ego represents mature and adaptive behavior that allows a person to function successfully in the world. Freud believes that anxiety results from the ego's attempts to balance the impulse instincts of the id with the astringent rules of the superego. Freud also developed the concept of transference and countertransference. Transference refers to when a client displaces onto his therapist the attitude and feelings that the client originally experienced in another relationship. Transference patterns are automatic and unconscious in a therapeutic relationship. For example, an adolescent female client working with a nurse who is about the same age as the teenager's mother might react to the nurse like she reacts to her parents. She might experience intense feelings of rebellion. She might make sarcastic remarks these reactions are actually based on her experience with her mother or parents rather than her experience with the nurse. Countertransference occurs when a therapist displaces onto the client attitudes or feelings from his or her past. For example, a female nurse who has a teenage child and who is experiencing extreme frustration with an adolescent client may respond by adopting a parental and chasing tone with the client. 
the nurse is counter-transferring her own attitude and feelings toward her children onto the client. Nurses can deal with counter-transference by examining their own feelings and responses, using self-awareness and talking with their colleagues. Freud's theory on defense mechanisms was developed by both himself and his wife, Anna. Freud believed that the self or ego uses ego defense mechanisms, which are methods of attempting to protect the self and cope with basic drives or emotional painful thoughts, feelings, or events. These are 12 of the defense mechanisms that Freud and Anna developed together. There is a comprehensive list of the defense mechanisms on page 42 and 43 of your book in table 3.1. Please refer to them. It has the defense mechanism as well as the definition and an example of that particular defense mechanism. We will review some of the 12 listed and I will give you a few examples as his list is exhaustive and we're not going to spend that much time on Freud's defense mechanisms. So compensation is considered overachievement in one area to offset a real perceived deficiency in another area. So many of you might be familiar with the Napoleon complex. Um, or another example can be a nurse with low self-esteem working double shifts so that her supervisor will like her. Okay, now I am going to skip down to projection. Projection is unconscious blaming of unacceptable inclinations and thoughts on an external object. So an example of this is a man who has thoughts about same sender sex relationships but never had one, beats up a man who was gay. All right, we're going to now jump down to regression. Regression is moving back to a previous developmental stage to feel safe or have needs met. So an example of this is a five-year-old who asks for a bottle when new baby brother is being fed. Or a man who pouts like a four-year-old if he's not the center of his girlfriend's attention. And we'll review one more. Repression. So repression is excluding emotional, painful, or anxiety-provoking thoughts and feelings from conscious awareness. So some examples of this is a woman who has no memory of the mugging she suffered yesterday. Or a woman who has no memory before the age of seven when she was removed from abusive parents. So I only hit a few defense mechanisms. Again, Sigmund Freud has a very exhaustive list of defense mechanisms in your textbook, Table 3.1 on page 42 and 43. They are available for your reading pleasure. I have two charts that describe the developmental stages. One is from Sigmund Freud's Psychosexual Stages. The other one is Eric Erickson's Eight Stages of Psychosocial Development. Eric Erickson was a protege of Dr. Sigmund Freud, and he went on to develop his own theory for psychosocial development. So Sigmund Freud had five different stages. The first stage is the oral phase. And in the oral phase, the child is properly weaned off of feeding 
and establishes trust. In the event that they are not properly weaned off, they, did, they develop a oral fixation when they grow up, which could lead to addiction and other bad habits. The next phase is the anal phase. In the anal phase, the gratification for this child has to do with their ability to control their bowels and bladder. The next stage is the phalaic stage. And this is when boys are attached to their mothers and contend or rival against their fathers for their mother's attention and girls do the same towards their fathers. Then we have the latency phase. And in the latency phase, children spend most of their time interacting mostly with the same sex peers. And then lastly, Freud has the genital stage, which is beyond puberty. And in the genital stage, sexual urges are reawakened and they are directed more towards the opposite sex and peers. Individuals in this stage form ego and their superego and can balance their wants, which is their id, with their reality, their ego, and their ethics, their superego. Now, as for Erickson, Eric Erickson has um, eight developmental stages. His first stage of development is the stage of trust versus mistrust which is very similar to Freud's. Um, his age range goes to 18 months. Nevertheless, it is still in the infant stage. Then we have autonomy versus shame and doubt, which is the toddler stage. And this age range is from 18 months to three years old. The preschooler is initiative versus guilt. And that's age three to five. And then we have the grade schooler or industry, industry versus inferiority. And that's age five to 13. And our teenager or adolescent stage is identity versus role confusion. And that's from age 13 to 21. Then we have intimacy versus isolation, which is our young adult stage. And that's age 21 to 49. Genitivity versus stagnation. And that's middle age adult between the age of 40 and 65. And the later years, which is integrity versus despair. And that's the older adult. And that's age 65 onward or till death. So we will not get into depth about any of these stages for Erickson or Sigmund Freud development. Because you will address these again in pediatrics you will focus more on the child stages, but you will address the psychosocial development and pediatrics more intently. Here we have a picture of Dr. Manslow, the father of the hierarchy of needs. Dr. Manslow was born in Brooklyn, New York. He initially went to school for law, and then he decided to pursue psychology at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Maslow focused on five broad needs, 
the first being physiological, next, safety and security, the third, love and belonging, fourth, esteem, and the fifth one is actualization of self. Dr. Maslow led a humanistic movement which grew out of the assumption that people have a natural tendency to be friendly, cooperative, and constructive. His theory was a client-centered theory. And for nurses, there is an importance on human potential and strength. Also, this hierarchy helps nurses to prioritize nursing actions and what the nurse can do for the patient on the continuum of care to meet their needs. Dr. Manslow and Rogers are both humanistic theorists. Here we have a picture of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how it is sectioned off into client-centered needs. And Dr. Manslow believed in unconditional positive regard, genuineness, empathy, and understanding, which also supported Roger's view of client-centered therapy. So first we have the physiological needs and safety needs, which fall under very basic needs for a human survival. Then we have belonging and love needs and esteem needs, which falls under a psychological need for a human. And then we have self-actualization, which is achieving one's full potential, including creativity and creative activities. And that falls under self-fulfillment needs. Our next theorist is Dr. Pavlov, who was a Russian physiologist and he won a Nobel Prize for his work. He is famous for classical conditioning, which is a picture, this picture on the right displays the conditioning uh, techniques that he used to develop his theory. So before conditioning, you have a unconditioned stimulus, such as dog food, and then you have an unconditioned response, such as the dog salivating because of the food that he sees before him. This is a natural response and it's untaught. Then what happens is the therapist, the theorist introduces the bell in place of the food. So the bell is con considered a neutral stimuli and the natural response from the dog is no salivation. And then the therapist introduce the bell with the food. And the unconditioned response is salivation as the food is being associated with the bell. Last, after conditioning phase, the therapist introduced the bell as a conditioned st stimulus and the dog's response was salivation as a conditioned response. So the dog associated the bell with the food from the process of conditioning. So next we'll review B.F. Skinner's theory of operative conditioning. And B.F. Skinner believes all behaviors are learned and the behavior consequences are either a reward or a punishment. And the rewarded behaviors are those that usually reoccur. So continuous reinforcement is the fastest way to increase a behavior. However, intermittent, random intermittent reinforcement is a slower 
route to increase a behavior, but it has the most long lasting effect. So BF Skinner definition of reinforcer is anything positive or negative that increases a behavior. So for nursing, we can use this in a behavior modification program to help um, encourage the behaviors that are um, beneficial to our patients. So we may give words of affirmation if a client's labs um, start to improve to encourage them to continue to eat right or to exercise or if a client is doing well with a smoking cessation program then we can definitely encourage them as well by just giving them praises and words of encouragement um, in reference to how their health is improving how well they're doing with this personal goal health goal of theirs and often they have diabetic programs where they'll have um, the diabetic patients, they come in and they meet with the nutritionist and the physician and staff to have their blood sugars checked and they are given rewards for reaching certain milestones. Some employers have health programs where if you lose a certain amount of weight or if you do a certain amount of educational health um, webinars, then you receive discounts in your health insurance. So there's all, there's many different ways that nursing and the medical field can use this operant conditioning to um, modify the behavior of the client. Jean Piaget, he developed the four stages of cognitive development. This theory explores how intelligence and cognitive function develops in children. Dr. Piaget believes the human intelligence progresses through a series of stages based on age. With a child at each successive stage demonstrating a higher level of functioning than the previous stage. Piaget strongly believed that biological changes and maturation were responsible for cognitive development. So the first stage is sensory motor, and that's when a child begins to interact with their environment. And that is from birth to two. The preoperational stage begins at the age of two, and it goes to about six or seven. And the child begins to represent the world symbolically. So as you see, this young lady has a stethoscope and she's listening to the bear's heart. In the concrete operational stage, the child learns rules such as conservation. And this stage begins approximately six or seven and goes up until the approximately 11 or 12. And in the formal operation stage, Adolescents can transcend the concrete situation and think about their future. So this is from ages 12 to adulthood. Existential theories is the belief that deviations occur when a person is out of touch with self or environment. The therapeutic goal is to return a patient, person back to their authentic sense of self. Cognitive theory focuses on immediate thought process. Most existential therapists believe in the cognitive theory. Milieu therapy is a method for treating mental health conditions using a person's surroundings to encourage healthier ways of thinking and behaving. Hildegard Peplau was the founder of Principles Governing Psychiatric Nursing, and therefore she's considered the first psychiatric nurse. 
Her theory mainly was concerned with how nurses help patients make positive changes in healthcare. Mrs. Peplau is the founder of Psychiatric Nursing, and she wrote Interpersonal Relations in Nursing in 1952. Hildegard believed relationships has phases. The nurse-patient relationship, rather, has phases, which we did review this in PPR, in Therapeutic Relationships. But just as a review, we have the pre-orientation phase, the orientation phase, the working phase, and the termination phase. Her theory is still relevant for therapeutic nursing care today. So let's discuss some of the goals of interpersonal relationship nursing theory so the goal is for the patient to learn adaptive coping, interacting, and relationship skills that can be generalized to other aspects of his or her life. The goal may involve behavioral interventions being implemented to achieve this therapeutic effect. So what is the role of the nurse in a therapeutic relationship? So I know we did review therapeutic relationships in PPR, but I just wanted to go over therapeutic relationships as it is essential to the care of the psychiatric patient. The role of the nurse. The nurse is responsible to ensure the patient's safety, encourage the patient to be independent as possible in ADLs and ongoing assessments. The skills that are needed are being, are being able to observe and to listen intently, to be present, develop an impression about the patient and the plan and intervention for the patient. So while you're observing and listening to the patient's concerns, you are doing a quick overview assessment of your patient and determining exactly where he or she is at this moment and what is his or her need so that you can intervene appropriately to make sure that your client achieves wellness and health. Also observing yourself in the relationship to the patient. So make sure that you have the proper distance, that you're not invading their personal space or seeming threatening in any manner. Make sure that you are in a position of neutral and hopefully a position where you can develop a trust and a trusting relationship. You can gain their confidence in your abilities and your skills. The nurse can also advocate for the patient by supporting whatever decision they make. Even if this decision is not a good decision, the nurse must support that patient, try to gain their trust, then we can try to see if the patient is able to make a decision that is more beneficial to their care. Or, um, they can, you can come to a consensus of something that would be more beneficial to the patient's care and also will help to de-escalate the situation. And the job of the nurse is also just to be there, be present and care for your patient. Hildegard Pavlov's levels of anxiety include four different levels. Mild anxiety, which is considered to be a healthy, positive state. It allows you to be aware and solve problems, and it is good for learning new behaviors. Moderate anxiety, which decreases your, your um, peripheral field and your focus is only on the immediate tasks. Then you have severe anxiety, which involves feeling of dread and terror. 
then you have panic anxiety. And panic anxiety can be rational thoughts, irrational thoughts, delusions, hallucinations, complete physical immobility and muteness. And also remember that high pitch rapid speech are signs of anxiety as well. There are four stages of crisis that occur in response to a variety of life situations and events. And they are exposure to stressors, increased anxiety when using coping ineffectively, increased efforts to cope, this equilibrium, significant distress. Ms. Paplau also developed three crisis categories. Maturation crisis, sometimes called developmental crisis, are predictable events in the normal course of life. Situational crises are unanticipated sudden events that threaten the individual's integrity. Advantageous crisis, sometimes called social crisis. So now I want to discuss the importance of communication. So I know when we talked about therapy communication, we did review the importance of communication with our clients or patients, as well as with our colleagues or the interdisciplinary team. So I want to inform you that when caring for patients, your nonverbal communication is as important, if not more important than your verbal communication, especially when you are trying to establish a trusting relationship or a therapeutic relationship with your client. So let's talk about some key aspects of the clinical interview. First, the setting. Make sure your patient has a confidential and private area to honor your patient's confidentiality. So you want to be seated at the same height of your patient. You do not want to be standing over top of your patient, but you want to be eye to eye or eye level with your patient. You should be within an arm's distance of your patient and not really far back or too close where they feel like their space is being invaded or they may feel intimidated by your presence. You want to make sure you introduce yourself your name, your position while you're there. You want to initiate the conversation with an open-ended question. Ask them to tell them a little bit about themselves. What's going on? Why are they here today for treatment? Speak briefly. Let the patient take the lead of the conversation and listen. Avoid advice, relaying relying on questions only. So you want to just ask open-ended questions to get their story, understand where they are currently in the moment and what has occurred to bring them there for that particular moment in time. Keep your focus on the patient always. For anything that we do in nursing, the outcome is our ultimate end goal. So our goal for the interview, the client interview is as follows. That the client will verbalize their concerns. The client will request assistance. The client will also communicate their needs. These are our goals. Now we will review effective communication techniques or therapeutic communication, which we reviewed in PPR. I will not go into depth with each of these listed, but I do want to emphasize the importance of therapeutic communication and utilizing therapeutic communication techniques. These are essential when caring for your patient, whether psychiatric patient or not but these are very essential in developing a trusting and therapeutic relationship. So our first one we have is active listening. 
And so you want to respond to the patient with reflection on the verbal message. So you also want to pay attention to their nonverbal behaviors as well as their verbal um, behaviors or messages. Restate. So you want to restate the client's message that they convey to you in your own words, clarifying the statement or verifying that you heard them correctly. So you would like to say, so it, if I'm correct, I heard you say that you feel sad every single day. That is just restating in your own words what the client conveyed to you. We also have exploring with the patient, open-ended questions, patient-centered activities, using silence. So we talked about the use of silence and sometimes it's just allowing the patient time to think, allowing patient time to answer your question. And it's okay for a period of silence to occur and for you to allow the patient to break the silence. And during the clinical interview, you want to maintain eye contact, you want to maintain a nice calm tone, and you want to be stationary, not pacing, but be present in the moment and attentive to the client's needs. And so here is a cartoon or a meme, I guess that shows poor communication amongst the medical professionals here. And he's saying, and that is why we lift one three. So it seems like there was a miscommunication. Maybe someone did not lift on three, the patient fell, or they did not count to three and the patient fell. But nevertheless, it's a nice cartoon that depicts what poor communication in healthcare can result in. So here we have a few more effective communication techniques. We will not review them all. Um, so we also have uh, reflecting, so um, focusing, asking direct questions, um, reality and redirection, summarization or summarizing, Use of self-disclosure, there's pros and cons to that because you don't want to take away the attention from the patient. And they have, I have one here, why, and the question mark. So don't ever ask the patient why something occurred because that could put a person on a defense mode and you do not want that. That is contrary to developing a um, therapeutic relationship. So... Um, why is not something you ever want to ask any of your patients, psychiatric patients or not, but you want to stay more on um, open-ended questions or restatements or summarizing what they have told you um, and or maybe even reflecting. So understanding and reflecting on the patient's verbal message, observing verbal and nonverbal behaviors. These are the areas that you want to focus on for therapeutic communication with your patient um, and even sometimes when you are with your colleagues so that we will not have a fall um, because someone did not count. So let's talk about some barriers to communication. First, asking irrelevant personal questions can put a person on defense and this is contradicted in therapeutic communication. Also, offering personal opinions or giving advice can cross the lines of a professional relationship. And this can either offend a person or cause um, relationship barriers to be blurred. So do not offer opinions or advice, even if they ask you for your opinion or your advice. Tell them that you are not allowed to do such and give them your professional knowledge that you know from your working and your educational experience. 
minimizing so you never want to belittle a person's experience, thoughts, or feelings. Their experience, thoughts, and feelings are valid even if you do not see eye to eye with what they are saying. You cannot minimize how a person feels or has perceived a situation. Giving false reassurance. We cannot tell a person that everything's going to be all right, that they're going to live to see next year, that they're going to come out of surgery um, better than they were when they went in. False reassurance is an automatic mistake because we have no idea of the outcome of any patient's care. Our goal is optimal outcome for every patient, but that may not be the case for every patient. Never ask why. Asking why puts a person on defense, makes them feel like you're judging them or questioning their judgment. So never ask a person why. You want to just ask them to describe what occurred or what brought them here and let them explain in their own words their thinking and their reasoning behind what happened. Responding approvingly or disapprovingly. So, do not uh, um, approve or disapprove in a situation, scenario, or anything that is presented by your client. You are a neutral ear, a neutral being, almost like a recorder of the events, and that's all. Your opinion your thoughts, whether you approve or disapprove, does not matter because we should be accepting of all regardless of the situation or circumstance. And in the event that you are unable to accept what you're hearing, the situation that you're in, then that's when you excuse yourself, speak with a colleague and ask if you can be relieved, if someone else can step in because you are unable to handle the situation. You have known your limitations and you are incapable of continuing to care for this patient for whatever reason. Maybe it's some trauma that occurred in your life and this is a trigger for you. But nevertheless, remove yourself from the position. Do not approve, disapprove. Um, remember, we want to keep a, a steady tone and a calm demeanor. So make sure that you get a coworker to step in in your place. Okay, so watch your body language. Body language says a lot. You want to maintain eye contact and make sure you have at least four to six feet of space in between yourself and the client. These are attending behaviors. These are behaviors that are nonverbal that can either make or break a nurse client relationship. So in my picture here, you see the man with his hands on his waist. This position is a position of dominance and communicates that there could possibly be an issue here and he's taking charge. Then you have the other picture of the man with his arms behind his back. And this is communicating stay away, don't come any closer. So both can be perceived as a threatening stance. So just be aware of your body language. Some safety techniques when dealing with a patient that will protect both the nurse and the patient. First, you want to keep your interview brief Make sure your statements are clear. Check back in on your patient. Make sure they are orientated and they are safe. In the event that your patient's anxiety begins to increase, you want to de-escalate the situation as quickly as possible and look for egress or a way out. So I know you guys learned about therapeutic relationships and PPR, so we are going to briefly review therapeutic relationships. As I have specified earlier in our lesson, 
the importance of developing a therapeutic relationship with your client, whether it is a psychiatric patient or not, is very important. So I do want you to remember that when engaging in a therapy relationship, the focus is always the client. So you want to make sure that you are um, meeting the needs of the client, that you have a listening and tentative ear to the client so that you can develop this therapeutic trusting relationship. So here are some key techniques. So we have development of trust, expressing genu genuine interest, empathy, acceptance, positive regard, setting professional boundaries, and therapeutic use of self. So I will review uh, briefly some of these interventions just as a refresher. So acceptance, you want to accept the patient for who they are, accept them in the state that they're in. You do not want to have a judgmental attitude. You do not want to negatively regard them because of their illness, their circumstance, their situation, or past history. We are nurses to care for everyone. In the event that you cannot, for whatever reason, that you recognize your self-limitations, your beliefs, your values will not allow you to care for this individual, remove yourself from the care of that individual and ask a colleague to step in. So um, empathy, again, is different than sympathy. So you do want to make sure that you understand those differences. Professional boundaries, so you want to make sure that the lines are not blurred, that you are not hugging your patients or calling them mom or honey or acting inappropriately with your patients. You do not want to share your personal information with your patients. You want to keep a professional relationship and professional boundaries and not confuse your patient with blurred lines in the relationship. Self-awareness is another topic we addressed in PPR, but we will be hearing about self-awareness frequently throughout our psychiatric lesson because this is an important key to caring for your patient. So self-awareness is the process of developing an understanding of oneself. Self-awareness involves changing one's own values and beliefs. So with self-awareness, you have to realize that no one treatment approach is effective for all clients. And also utilizing psychosocial approaches increases the nurse's effectiveness. So um, therapeutic, nursing interventions, as well as encouraging the medication regimen or treatment um, or counseling that is recommended, all will help bring about mental wellness for a mentally healthy patient. Clients' feelings, perceptions, most influential in determining his or her response. So you want to make sure you are allowing the patient to express themselves and express their feelings and not feel like they are going to be judged and therefore reluctant to share or open up. So that has to do with us recognizing our own beliefs, our own nonverbal and verbal um, responses to our patients as well. And the nurse should be culturally competent and be able to provide culturally competent care and identify his or her own biases, feelings about the culture of the other person as well as recognize their own beliefs, values, and cultural um, limitations.